Welcome to Conversations the World Over. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Thanks for being here. As we continue my talk with the legendary political reporter Bob Novak. I sat down with him in 2007 to discuss his memoir, The Prince of Darkness, 50 Years Reporting in Washington. Last time we talked about his life and career in D.C. Tonight, Bob tells us about his conversion to Catholicism, as well as his role in the infamous Valerie Plame affair. Here's part two of my conversation with the late Robert Novak. You know, we should ask right off the bat, why the Prince of Darkness? You know, people are going to think you're, you know, you've become a Satanist here. You know, the uh, pastor of my church in, at St. Patrick's here, uh, when he heard the name of it, he wondered if they would have to do an exorcism with me. You know, <laughs> but uh, uh, a young reporter from the, uh, uh, when I was a young reporter with the Wall Street Journal, I'm 28 years old, covering the Senate, and a uh, colleague from the Washington Post and I used to uh, clean it, close up the Senate every night. We couldn't leave till they adjourned. And, drove through the final hours, and we had these long conversations about the fate of Western civilization and <laughs> the political uh, game. And I was so uh, critical of uh, the way government was and the po political class that he said, you know, you really talk like the Prince of Darkness. <laughs> and uh, that, that word kind of spread around the press gallery, and it, uh, a lot of people don't even know what the origins was. So a lot of people think it's because I am a conservative. and, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm for limited government and low taxes and individual economic freedom, and that makes you the Prince of Darkness, I guess. <laughs> Tell us about that landmark book, Whitaker Chambers' book, uh, Witness. What impact did that have on you? I was a uh, uh, second lieutenant in the Army and during the Korean War, and uh, mm -hmm. I thought I was probably going to go to Korea, and, and I, had, I had considered myself a, uh, uh agnostic uh, when I went into the Army, but. I suddenly realized I might be killed, and I didn't. I didn't want to pray not to go, but I wanted to pray that if that I I would commend myself. I just started praying naturally that I would uh, commend myself uh, well, perform well if I went into combat. And right about that time, uh, I read Witness by Whitaker Chambers, and President Truman had run the Korean War so badly. There was such anger. I was a second lieutenant, and there was such anger in the officer class about not having enough supplies and ammunition, not being able to do our thing and in a static situation. And I wondered if this whole Cold War was phony. And uh, uh, Whitaker Chambers had a great impact on me in two ways. One, it, it indicated that the war against communism was something that was very important to our survival as a, as a free country. And s secondly, it was important because he really believed that all the world divided itself on those who were with God and against God. And I. I began to wonder, which side am I on? I'm certainly not against God, but am I with God? Not really, because I don't, I don't go to church, I don't have a religion. And so that set seeds that really didn't gestate for, for many years. What I love between all the political machinations that you report and your insider view of all these major stories that you not only reported, but in some cases were a part of, there is this spiritual tug one feels from the very beginning of the book. Um, and the Chambers incident is certainly coming across that book, Witness. And we should say Whitaker Chambers became a, he was a, a uh, communist who then t turned, t totally transformed his life yes. and became a militant anti-communist. And, and, and a man of God, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, that, and, that, uh, and the book is beautifully, big, fat tome. I think you have it over there. Um, but what I love about it is then we see you kind of drifting in and out uh, trying to find a spiritual home. Tell us a little about that after your marriage to Geraldine and what happens. Well, we, we really, uh, we were married in a, in a, she was a Methodist and uh, uh, hadn't, had, was not really practicing and we were married in a, in a Presbyterian church. It was a, I knew it was a, I lived in Georgetown and it was a, a preacher and he, was, he gave us a kind of a non Christian ceremony, <laughs> if, you know, if you know what I mean. It was very, yeah. it was very pretty and very right. nice, but not very Christian. Mm -hmm. And then we went to, uh, 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 we lived on Capitol Hill and we went to an Episcopalian church for a while, but I didn't, I didn't like it much. I was very uncomfortable with the liturgy and I just, I just thought all this religious mum mumbo jumbo bothered me. But uh, my wife started looking for a church. She felt a need after many, many years. Children were, were growing really. And uh, she was looking, I, she, was, she had become a pro-life activist. And it wasn't, it wasn't the religion sent her into the pro-life movement. The pro-life movement 
sent her looking for a church. Again. Really? Yes. And what impact did that have on you? Well, she she uh, she couldn't find any any Pres any Protestant church that was pro life. So we moved from the suburbs after the kids were out of college into this apartment where I am right today, downtown Washington. And she walked over to St. Patrick's Church. And that was the first church she said. She said, you know, would you like to go? I think this is one you would like. And for, you know, I really believe the Holy Spirit is at work because it's hard to explain these, these mysteries. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I, I felt comfortable. Now, was it comfortable because suddenly I found one of the priests there was a man named Peter Vaghi who I had known as a Republican lawyer, a great uh, political operative, a great uh, news source, of, more of Rowley Evans than of, of me. Was it just that he made me more comfortable? Maybe that was part of the whole of the Holy Spirit. And at about the same time, my dear friend Jeff Bell, mm -hmm. a Republican politician who was a Catholic convert, but not at the same time, a little later, put me in touch with uh, uh, Father C. John McCluskey, mm -hmm. who was an Opus Dei priest and a great proselytizer. Mm -hmm. And he started having breakfasts and lunches with me and uh, well, these lunches went on and breakfast Bob for 20 years that's right I and mean it wasn't like you were a quick hit here Bob no. this is a long what did he say I mean how, he, well, we talk he uh, we talk meetings? about Paul he's a conservative we talk about politics we talk about how bad some of the politicians were and uh, very seldom would he would he on his own bring it up and sometimes I'd ask him a question and you know I said I, I went to mass the other day and and they said that the uh, the wafer was really the body of Christ. How, how can anybody believe that? You, know, you have to mm. believe that to, to, <laughs> to be, be a Catholic. And he said, "Yeah, you do." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, 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 so it, it was a very soft sell, could we say? Oh, uh, yeah. uh, sort of thing. And so there was there was, there was two things happened, and then uh, this went on for years. And then there was an event that I write about um, in in the book in Syracuse. In Syracuse University, I was giving a speech. Uh, there and the sponsoring group, the, the the college Republicans, as they do before a lecture, they have the the committee has a little uh, uh, dinner for you before, and there were all all men and one young woman, and I noticed uh, that she wore around her neck a uh, a, cru a crucifix, mm -hmm. and uh, I said, uh, "Are you a Catholic?" And I don't know why I asked her that. It's you know I usually don't ask things like that, and I thought she said yes. As it turns out, I've later found she said no. She was Greek Orthodox, and uh, but I thought she said yes. And then she said, "Are you a Catholic?" I said, "No." I said that my wife and I have been going to mass for many years, and she said, uh, "Are you going to convert?" I said, "No. We have no such plans." And she said, "Mr. Novak, uh, life is short, but eternity is forever." And I got a chill up my back. I got a chill right now when I said it. I always get a chill when I think of that. And it was like the Holy Spirit was, was, was there. I could hardly sleep that night. And I came back to Washington the next morning. I told Geraldine, I think I'm ready to be a Catholic. And I think she was ready, had been ready for a long time. Hmm. The funny thing is this woman, uh, I didn't know her name. And, and when I wrote, started writing this book many years later, 10 years later, uh, I found out that there was only one woman at that dinner. Hmm. So I got my staff, my arch crack staff yeah. found our She's married with a child, and uh, called her up, and she said, uh, uh, "Well, she said I, uh, I, I sometimes wear a crucifix." She said, "But I'm not Catholic, so it couldn't have been me." And she said, "I might have said that." She said, "But I don't remember saying it." And so I was really in a quandary. And then she sent me an email of her picture with her, uh, with her husband and baby, and it was her. I will never forget her face. Uh -huh. It was the same woman. So I think that the Holy Spirit is working but in the fact she didn't exactly remember it, mm -hmm. and, and I remembered her saying something that she really didn't say. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Tell me about, you, you then convert. You come into the church um, at St. Patrick's here in Washington, D.C. You take the patron saint, St. Thomas More. That's right. Why? Because I, I felt that he was an example of somebody who showed the, uh, uh, the, the I often, when I give a, a, spe a commencement speech, somebody is foolish enough to have me as a commencement <laughs> speaker, I tell the graduates, uh, always love your country, but never trust your government. <laughs> and, I, and I don't think politicians or, or governments are to be trusted. And certainly, uh, uh, Thomas More uh, went, to the, uh, went to, the, uh, uh, to the block to have his head chopped off by Henry VIII uh, because, because he would not submit 
to government. He was Chancellor of England. He wore the, the, the symbol of Paul around his neck, and underneath the, the, uh, the, the ermine robes, he wore a hair shirt, because he was a Christian, Christian ascetic, Catholic ascetic. And he, uh, he, 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 uh, he com uh, uh, wrote uh, in Latin to Erasmus. They had a correspondence going, mm -hmm. and they talked about a national community of peace to do away with war, to do away with war in the in the 16th century. I mean, that was a that's what all governments were for was, right. was was to make war. He was a truly gr great man, and you know, uh, uh, pe people say, "What do you think? You're Thomas More?" No, I'm not Thomas More. They don't they don't threaten me with shoving my head off, <laughs> and I'm not a Chancellor of England. But he's an inspiration to me. And I, I write in three places. I write in a little office down the hall here in my mm -hmm. apartment. I write how, a place where my office downtown, and then we have a, a summer home in Delaware on the ocean where I have a little office. And at each desk, there's a picture of Thomas More. So I write everything I write. His picture is looking up at me. Hmm. Did you find any solace from Thomas More during all of this? During really the public trial you went through, starting in July of 2003, with an run-of-the-mill article you wrote, a little column you wrote that you turned in three a week or two a week now, three, it's still three, three a week, week yeah. on, on Valerie Plame, mentioning this woman who was a CIA operative in passing. In passing. I did, the only reason I mentioned her was how in the world did Joe Wilson, who was a Clinton staffer, didn't know anything about intelligence, didn't know anything about weapons of mass destruction, why was he sent on this mission where he didn't even come back with a conclusive report. Mm -hmm. And um, the answer was that his wife works at the CIA and she suggested it. So it was a little, a little twist of the kind of little inside dope I like to, 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 to write about. And it just, it, some, it took a long time for people to get excited, but uh, the critics of President Bush thought that this was a, a wedge to really get, uh, to get after him. And the answer to your question, yes, uh, Thomas More and my faith was a solace to me. And, uh, and I really felt that uh, uh, a lot of people turned against me. I must say that the Chicago Sun Times was all my home paper was always supportive. Washington Post was wonderfully supportive of me. They run my run my column for all the years I've written it. And uh, uh, but a lot of people, a lot of my comrades, brothers and sisters in journalism, uh, uh, turned against me on this mm -hmm. for no reason because this story was blown way way out of proportion, as if there was some some plot to uh, to do a hint. I just got to say one thing, and sure. that is that uh, the person who leaked her name to me, or told me her name, was the Deputy Secretary of State, uh, Richard Armitage, who was uh, very critical of the war. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I was very critical of war. I was opposed to the invasion of Iraq. So the idea that this was some plot to justify the war was ridiculous. Why do you think Armitage leaked the name to you? I think he's a gossip. Mm -hmm. And he, he heard, he saw it in, in, a, in a paper. They were trying to explain to themselves why in the world Joe Wilson was, and they put this out. And uh, uh, he told me that, and he looked in my eyes. I saw, saw it, but that was a funny thing. He said, and he said, I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, that's really Evans and Novak, isn't it? And mm -hmm. the kind of uh, uh, little gossipy items that we had, uh, we had trafficked in for so many years. Now, some said, um, and they, they continue to say, you endangered Valerie Plame's missions abroad. She was a CIA operative, um, and, you, and, and therefore you endangered government agents in the field. She had not been in the field for many, many years. She had, my information is, she had been outed by the, age, by the, uh, the uh, traitor Aldrich Ainge, the Soviet agent. Uh, she had, there was no plans to send her abroad as, as an agent. And, uh, 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 I talked to the CIA, of course, about this mm -hmm. to confirm that she worked there, and uh, uh, they didn't want me to use her name. They don't want you to use anything. But all they had to do, all they had to do, was say this is going to endanger her life. It's going to endanger our operations, and I wouldn't have written it. And if they had any doubt about it, I was in contact with George Tenet, then the director of Central Intelligence. Mm -hmm. All they had to do was put him on the phone and have him tell me that. But nobody told me that. So the reason they didn't tell me it wasn't true. And another thing is that the special prosecutor, if she had been uh, a, a, an agent under the terms of the, of the act that makes that a felony, Richard Armitage would have been charged. He was never even a prosecutorial target. Mm -hmm. But even if he had been charged, and he wasn't, right. I would not have been because the person the journalist who 
conveys the operation under the, the information under that act, if I violate it, the journalist is never liable. Hmm. That's, that's the law. Tell me for a moment if, in hindsight, would you reveal her identity today? Every, everybody asks me that. I don't, I don't really know. All the trouble I went through, the money that's, it cost me, mm -hmm. the, the, the pain, I think it was a valid story. I Absolutely. still think it was extremely valid. Whether I would do it knowing all this, it's really hard to say. Hmm. Do, you, do you think when you look back um, at this particular case, so many journalists, they're still up in arms about revealing sources, should we have private, uh, you know, uh, should we grant amnesty and, and uh, you know, to our sources? Uh, sh what do you think? Should we Should there be a shield law? Right. I think there should be a shield law because uh, uh, there, are, uh, there is no protection for me. If I had, mm -hmm. if I had refused to cooperate with the, uh, with the, with special, the prosecutor. With, with special prosecutor, I could have uh, gone to jail as Judy Miller did for no particular reason. Now, uh, let me say this. When I sat down for the first time across from Patrick Fitzgerald, uh, the first thing he indicated to me is he knew that Richard Armitage was my, was my source. And I thought to myself, boy, this is some the detective. This is Elliot Ness. Oh. But that wasn't the case at all. He had, uh, uh, Mr. Armitage had revealed himself to the Justice Department oh. three weeks before uh, Fitzgerald was named. So Fitzgerald was given the information when he walked into the office. Why didn't the Justice Department handle the case themselves? Because they were afraid. They were cowards. They didn't know how to handle Armitage. They didn't know whether he'd charge him. They didn't know whether or not to charge him. And they just wanted to give it off to somebody else. And that created all this uncertainty and uh, difficulty for, for years to come. Wow. Do you consider yourself an advocate journalist? That name, that, that, that moniker now uh, uh, seems to be bandied about a lot. Not necessarily in relation to you, but many are describing themselves as such. I, I am not because I don't, I don't go out and say uh, we must, uh, uh, we, we shouldn't invade Iraq. I never wrote that, that column. Mm -hmm. uh, I did kind of say it on television it was wrong mm -hmm. because it was a different uh, form of on the Capitol Band, right. yes. But uh, the column, that isn't the kind of column, but I do write information indicating there was no weapons of mass destruction, indicating the trouble that, that lie ahead. So uh, I have a point of view uh, based on factual reporting but I am. Uh, I don't. I don't think that people, when they when they read Robert Novak in the morning in the newspaper, want to be told what to think. They want to get some new facts. Hmm. Let's talk for a moment about the great. I mean, you have known every president really since Truman. Um, tell me. Give, I'm going to mention their names, and I want you to give me kind of a snapshot of your impressions of these men and your personal dealings. Lyndon Baines Johnson, a manipulative, a masterful legislative leader. Uh, counted, was able to count heads. He tried to count supporters in the millions when he was president. That didn't work so well. I thought he was a poor president and certainly a, a very bad war president. But you wrote a very fair and well-reviewed book, uh, The Exercise of Power, on that yes. president, you and Raleigh. And, but the, the, the greatest praise for him came in the first half of the book when he was majority leader. Mm -hmm. uh, Ronald Reagan. The only totally, the only fundamentally successful president in my 50 years in Washington because he knew that the presidency was, a, uh, was not a uh, management job, it was a leadership job. He was there to inspire people. He also uh, did, uh, was there for very limited uh, goals. He wasn't uh, a micromanager as Johnson was who tried to run the whole government, and every little thing, and Reagan uh, wanted to uh, regenerate the economy, win the Cold War, and revive the spirit of the American people who did all three. Jimmy Carter. <clears throat> Maybe the worst president uh, in my time. Why do you say uh, that? Because I think he was a liar. I think he was an incompetent. He lied to me. He lied to the American people. He was, a, he was the worst party leader uh, we had. The Democratic Party was very split under him. <clears throat> they hated his presidency. And I think that's one of the functions of a president. He must be a party leader. George Bush Sr. and George W. I think they were mediocre. I think they were uh, mediocre presidents. I think they were really old-fashioned liberal Republicans hiding under a conservative cloak uh, who really liked big government, a lot, a lot of use of government. Uh, and also, I do believe uh, particularly George W. Bush has the belief that uh, the use of American force can spread democracy around the world in the, uh, uh, in the manner of Woodrow Wilson. And I think that is an illusion uh, fraught with danger. President Richard Nixon. 
uh, I thought he was a bad man and a bad president. I think he was a, a, a cheat, a manipulator. Uh, I think he uh, was not a conservative. He, uh, the, the government that uh, was built up openly under Johnson was encouraged in stealth by him. Uh, I thought the Watergate scandal was uh, uh, hurt the, par the country conservative and the, and the Republican Party for years to come. Mm. I want to talk about you for a moment, your future. You say in the book you're, <laughs> you're on your fourth cancer now, yes? Yes, I have. I think it's, we think it's a cancer. We're watching it. Uh, it, uh, it hasn't grown in many years. It's on a, it's on a kidney. And uh, um, my, my great cancer doctor, Dr. Morton in California, thinks that uh, uh, it may survive me. So it, uh, we're, we're not doing anything right now. I had three cancers that were removed, one prostate, one lung, and one kidney. Hmm. Amazing. You say in the book, after mentioning your, your newest uh, addition, that the Lord has a purpose for me. What do you think it is? I'm not entirely sure, because I think the world, Lord works in, in mysterious ways. I hope it's to do what I'm doing, to, uh, to try to tell the truth, to be honest, uh, to, re, to stand up to my principles, and uh, uh, to try to do it in, in a very limited way. I'm not Thomas More. I'm not uh, an advocate. I am not a, an, a great acolyte. I am, uh, I'm just a, a plain journalist trying to uh, reveal what the politicians are doing. And, I think, I think he wants me to do things in that way. Let me know what you thought of tonight's show and which of our interviews you'd like to see in an upcoming edition of Conversations the World Over. You can always write me at Raymond at RaymondArroyo.com. The new show premieres each Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time in the U.S. For those of you outside the United States, go to EWTN.com for your airtimes. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. The conversations continue, so don't miss them. Bye now.